Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm looking at the United States in 1945, in particular uh, post-war prosperity, uh, the uh, regional and ethnic and social divisions. So we're looking at some of the real positive things uh, about uh, the US at this point which kind of suggests um, the American dream is a reality and some of the, the more difficult stuff that's underlying it which suggests uh, that for um, the parts of American society it, it remains at this stage in time a myth. So from the uh, AQA A-level history specification 2Q, this is from the section United States in 1945 and the legacies of uh, the, the World War, <clears throat> in particular as, I, as on the first slide, uh, the post-war prosperity, regional ethnic and social divisions. So again, as I've said, the two sides of things. So to start off with, to start with the positives and, and look at post-war uh, post prosperity, well, America had experienced a, a kind of a wartime boom, and this continued into the early stages of the post-war era. During the, the Second World War, there was full employment, uh, pay was high, uh, notably due to the rise of, of trade unions, such as, as the American Federation of Labor, AFL, and the Congress of Industri Industrial Organizations, CIO. And, and, and these did a, a really good job of kind of negotiating pay uh, and, and making sure the the wage the, the, the not only into the wages but in in all in all manner of things that the workers were getting a good deal now with there being a massive shortage of labor they were in a really strong negotiating position because huge numbers of the men uh, were off fight, uh, fighting in the war now uh, unemployment stayed at four percent or lower for for the rest of the 1940s so a really low level un, level of unemployment and again this feeds into uh, the workers being in a um, a strong position and this meant that the negotiated pay and and the shortage of labor ensured that the workers had a high level of disposable income because they had good strong wages this then fed into a consumer boom uh, and this is where you get into a really positive cycle in a, in a stage of economics because you've got the workers with disposable income they buy stuff now the the major producer in the world at this point in time is america so they are largely then buying american stuff which is then producing more employment and generating more money within the more, more money within the economy and so you, it one thing then feeds the other and you, you start getting the economy doing incredibly well and growing uh, growing strongly and uh, you get a, a greater kind of feeling of prosperity as people were were able to buy kind of goods and things that they weren't able to before uh, and this is seen in, in showing that the workers in the 1940s were considerably better off than their parents had been uh, and the standards of living were driven driven up by their ability to buy goods such as refrigerators and vacuum cleaners and cars uh, again it's quite a remarkable statistic that about 80 percent of the world's cars at this point in time are in america so uh, the, there's all these new labor saving devices um there's these things that people all these other things you people can buy the the car opens up travel and opens up um kind of days out and holidays and all kinds of different things like that and so we, we're starting to see a, a real move into a kind of what can see a degree of a golden age in terms in terms of standard of living now <clears throat> there were some key industries that really flourished during the war such as aircraft um, electrical pharmaceutical motor food processing tobacco industries all of these were doing uh, incredibly well and the american economy overall was the most successful in the world and was the envy of most of the other nations <clears throat> and this meant that the american dream seems like a reality to, to many in america is that they were achieving um, a lifestyle uh, and and a standard of living that, that seemed unobtainable to most ordinary people in other countries and, and was above and beyond the standard of living that had been seen uh, by earlier generations uh, and it it seemed that levels of prosperity were an, an upward curve people just considered things were getting better and better and this created optimism again this is a real positive for an economy because if people just believe things are going to get better then then people tend to spend money if people spend money then that generates demand within the economy 
Other nations were in desperate need of raw materials and goods because they needed to rebuild their economies after the devastation of the Second World War. And America was in the prime position to supply these goods and these raw materials again. So America is incredibly rich with raw materials, but also its economy has not been damaged. And in fact, it's been flourishing and has managed to reach and been pushed to, to reach really high levels of production. Therefore, when goods are needed elsewhere, the Americans are in the ideal position to um, to supply it. And, and then on top of that, the Allied nations, now the war was ending, it ended that they were then starting to replay um, their, their loans and there were, there were some reparations from the defeated nations, some things like patents and things taken um, from Germany. Uh, one of the odd ones in this is, is it <coughs> leads to um, the patent for Fanta uh, getting passed over to, to America. Um, and now, the only real economic um, cloud in, in this is the need to find work for the millions of men um, returning from military service. So you've had this kind of wartime economic miracle. Well, can, can you keep that going when suddenly the labour market gets flooded? And that, that was going to be one of the major uh, challenges for Truman in his term in office. Now, America is not a homogeneous nation. It, it is it is a it is a, a country made up of lots of individual states. Now those states are often grouped together into uh, regions. Now I'm going to talk through some of these regions and and their importance and some stuff about their characteristics and what was happening in them. So the northeast is the most traditional uh, part of the UK, particularly at the top of the northeast, often referred to as New England. And the Northeast was traditionally politically dominant. It, it, it was also industrially dominant and, and it had some of the, the biggest and most important cities. So New York, Boston, Washington, D.C. Now, Washington's kind of borderlands between the kind of the, 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 North, the Northeast and, and, and the South. And then if you go in, in slightly inland, go a bit further further west, and you get places like Detroit and Pittsburgh. Now, Detroit in particular uh, had become the centre of the motor industry and, and, and was producing enormous amounts of cars uh, and, and it, also creating huge numbers of jobs. So uh, the, 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 the North East is the centre of industry. I mean, that's not to say there isn't industry elsewhere. I mean, there's particularly industry building up in the West, but the North East is kind of the dominant force in that. Now, it's also got the centres of, of finance and trade. So in, in Boston and New York are, are, are the two most important uh, ports on the East side. New York is the, the centre of uh, finance with Wall Street. So again, in all of this, there's, there's a lot of, money in the northeast and the population again and the population this is where most of the original population um of the european settlers had, had, had settled anyway but there was now there was mass migration into these uh, into this region from the more agricultural regions such as the south as people went seeking work uh, and particularly as that demand for work was so high uh, during the war period so bordering the northeast, we've got the Midwest. and uh, This is a very, very large area that spreads across the middle of America, uh, but it has a, a very low level of population. It doesn't have the major cities like you see in the northeast. And it's focused on industry, it's focused on agriculture, and it produces enormous amounts of food crops, in particular uh, wheat and corn, but also other crops like rice and, 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 and other food, and obviously a huge amount uh, of meat production as well in terms of um, things like cattle. Uh, and the, this also ensured that not only was the USA itself self-sufficient in, in food, but it also meant that it had large amounts of food that it could export. So in, in terms of raw materials, I mean, other parts of the states, they, they, they've got the, and the key things like oil and coal and, 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 and iron and steel. But the Midwest is, again, another really, really important raw material in all of this, which is things like wheat and corn. Now, another region of the US is the South. Now, the South, like the Midwest, was agricultural, but it, again, is very different to the Midwest in terms of the type of agriculture that it has. So the South concentrated on what we refer to as cash crops, um, cotton and sugar and tobacco, and these tended to be grown on land, large plantations. And this then takes us back uh, into the world of um, the pre-Civil War America and um, slavery and 
uh, and all the legacy of that. Now, the South really does stand out from the rest of the states, partly due to its far more conservative social views and and, and most troubling of all it, it, during this period of time, uh, the policy of racial segregation. Now, a lot of the attitudes in the South were still largely affected by the legacy of defeat in the Civil War. And again, there was a lot of rewriting of history in the South in terms of of how the war, Civil War was perceived. So that Civil War um, took place uh, between 1861 and 1865. It's often described as, as uh, the war that America never recovered from. Uh, and this kind of, the legacy of that really stuck out the idea of Southern difference and resentment against um, the, the Northeast in particular. So the, the South, particularly the Southeast, has a, a particular um, feel and, and, and history to it. In the Southwest, you've got states such as uh, Texas and New Mexico, Mexico and Arizona. These are very, very dry states, very, very hot, lots of deserts, and they're very, very oil rich as well. Um, and they, they had at this point expanding populations. There's, there's lots of land there, not a huge amount of people, and there is opportunity with, with things like uh, like oil. So you, you've got immigration into these areas, particularly um, from um, Mexico. But again, if you, again, if you go back through American history, if you go back uh, prior to uh, 1845, then Texas and New Mexico and Arizona were all in Mexico anyway. Um, we then, if we go further over to the west, we've got the west coast. Now, this is a, an increasingly important region in the US, um, in particular because of the growth of places like Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, the west coast uh, was notably more liberal than the rest of the US. It doesn't have the same steep in tradition that you might see in, in the northeast and in the south, but was increasingly wealthy. And you've got the things like the draw of Hollywood in LA, uh, and, and so it's increasingly important and wealthy, but it still doesn't feel like it, it gets its, it, the right amount of say in terms of political power, with the dominance still over on the East Coast. Another really important set of divisions in the, in the US is not just the regions, but also uh, in terms of ethnicity. Now, at this point in time, we're talking of a US population somewhere north of 145 um, million people. Now, the, by far and away, the dominant group at this point in time uh, were the white population, who made up about 130 million of that total. However, the white population itself was hugely subdivided, um, with people having strong connections to their country of origin. Now, it's not necessarily that they themselves came from that country. It might be that they, their parents did, or their grandparents did, or it might even be their great-grandparents did. And, but people kind of had a, a really strong attachment. And one thing you might notice, again, if you um, you study America, watch American TV, talk to Americans, is that often it, people, when referring to themselves as being American, that they often have some kind of prefix uh, on it, where they, they, they attach another ethnicity or another nationhood to it. So you, you would have Irish Americans, Italian Americans, Scottish Americans, Polish Americans, uh, German Americans. Um, the German Americans are actually one of the biggest groups, but Stressing kind of German ancestry obviously is something that people tended to be less forthcoming of um, following uh, World War One and in particular World War Two. Now, the, the, again, another way in which the white population was divided was, was to do with religion. Now, there, there, there was long running uh, anti-Catholic prejudice uh, within the US. Had been going on for a very, very long time, you go all, all the way back again to 100 years earlier, and you've got um, uh, political groups such as the Know Nothings who, who were partic particularly uh, anti Catholic. And in America, with an American culture, it is often set, described as being dominating, dominated by the wasps. That's not the insects, but wasps, as in white Anglo Saxon Protestants. And so that, that particular group were dominant. And again, uh, even though he, he ultimately goes on and becomes president, Kennedy often talks about his time growing up. And, and because even though he was in a very illustrious school, the fact that he was a, a Catholic, he was Catholic meant that he was um, not viewed in the same way as others. 
The next biggest uh, ethnic group in, in the US were African Americans, with, which made up about 14 million uh, people within the population. Now, they were largely living in the South with the, the legacy of um, slavery, suffering the injustices of the Jim Crow laws, which were set. It's kind of a generic name given to a whole series of discriminatory laws that were carried out in, in across the southern states to, to maintain the position of African Americans as, as essentially second class citizens. So although the 13th, uh, 14th and 15th Amendments going back to the 19th century had the 13th ended slavery, 14th Amendment gave citizenship rights and the 15th Amendment gave equality in voting or it essentially meant you couldn't be stopped from voting on the basis of, of your um, race or former position of servitude. But southern politicians found ways around this and the Jim Crow laws were, were imposed on the African-American community in the South and, and kept them as second class citizens. And, and one of the stories that you'll, you'll see as we go later through the unit is the story of civil rights and the uh, challenging and then overcoming uh, of these laws. Now, one of the side effects of all of this was what is known as the Great Migration. So between about 1910 and 1970, what we see is, is large numbers of African-Americans who had been living in the South migrating to work in the northern cities. Uh, and then they sell in the northern cities. And, and if you go to any of the major northern cities in, in America, you will find that there will be what are often seen as black areas. Now, whilst in the north, there was no legal segregation. So it, it wasn't something that was imposed directly by law or by government. There was almost segregation, um, but it's not by design, but but by outcome. Um, and African American communities tended to concentrate themselves in certain areas, and so there's some quite um, famous ones uh, such as Harlem in New York. Uh, and we we see again not 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 equality in terms of work and things like that in the north. The the, the African American workers often uh, were working in in the less well paid uh, jobs. And, and another area of discrimination that we see in this is, is um, in the army. Now, during World War Two, again, and this is this is something I always find almost completely unbelievable. But during World War Two, the American army fought in segregated units. So black soldiers fought in black units. They didn't fight in the, in, in, the, in uniform in in kind of mixed units with the the other soldiers. And so they, they went off to, to uh, Europe and they fought against the discriminatory racist ideology of the Nazis and then came home to face uh, continuing discrimination, particularly if they came back um, in, into the South. So there is deep seated problems in terms of these ethnic divisions in America. We've, we've got the legacy of the Civil War and slavery, which haven't been uh, haven't been properly addressed and, and degrees of discrimination and racism that are predominant in, in, in significant sections of American society. Now, and again, the, the, there's then a whole range of other ethnic minority groups in, in America. So um, the Hispanic Americans, which are about one to two million at this point in time, uh, largely concentrated uh, in the Southwest in places like Texas and Arizona and New Mexico, which essentially 100 years earlier had actually been parts of Mexico. And again, as there is demand for labor, we, we see uh, more and more uh, migration into the states from uh, Latin America, from Central and Southern America. <clears throat> You've also got Asian Americans that were somewhere between about a quarter and a third of a million. Uh, a majority of these were Chinese Americans, and, and th this population was there largely due to migration in the 19th century when Chinese workers had come across uh, to work on uh, the railroads. Uh, most lived in the West, which is, where, again, so the, you'd, you'd had the, um, the, the Transcontinental Railways meeting in the middle, and, and a lot of the Chinese workers have been working on uh, the, the railroad from from the West, moving, uh, moving east, and a lot of them settled in the West. There was also a population of Japanese Americans who suffered a huge amount of discrimination and suspicion during the war. Uh, many of them were put in internment camps during the, the war following Executive Order 9066, which excluded them from certain areas, coastal areas of the US. In, in fact, it was only um, in uh, on Hawaii that there wasn't mass internment. And actually, there was a significant Japanese population there. 
Uh, and though Hawaii at this point isn't actually a US state, doesn't become a US state until 1959. And so the, the story of, of Asian Americans, particularly Japanese Americans, during and in, in the immediate aftermath of, of the Second World War is one well worth looking into in, in more detail in terms of picking up on, on the not all being well in this idea of a melting pot and an equal, and, and equal chance for all in America, where where we, we see a group kind of singled out and, and badly treated. Talking of singled out and badly treated, again, we've got the Native American population, again, numbers around a third of a million, uh, largely uh, living on reservations. And if any of you have studied the American West in the 19th century, you'll know all about the stories of um, the, the the Native Americans being kind of concentrated into small and smaller areas and losing uh, the uh, large amounts of their way of life and um, a lot of the and, and having land essentially stolen from them. So they had suffered greatly in the previous centuries and the Native American population had been completely marginalized and largely kind of forgotten or ignored by mainstream American society at this point in time. Uh, the, the Native American population itself was internally divided as it, as it uh, uh, was divided into a number of tribes and, and there was often um, competition and rivalry and, and, and not necessarily a huge amount of collaboration between the different tribes at that point in time. In terms of social divisions, we well, a lot of this actually stems from, from what we just looked at. So ethnicity remained actually the biggest uh, dividing line and, and often had a huge impact on people's life chances. And therefore, again, you would so it's, you see a disproportionate number of people from the ethnic minority groups, notably African-Americans who in the South, who were at the bottom of the social pile and, and were kept there through through discriminatory laws. Now, there was some better news in terms of social mobility during this point, with, with millions of men leaving their homes and seeing other parts of America and other parts of the world for the first time and getting new opportunities um, and the, the fact that the armed forces offered development of, of kind of skills and opportunities and there was abundance of work gave, gave a lot of people an opportunity, a lot of ordinary Americans an opportunity to improve their position. Now, following the Great Depression, going back into to the 1930s, um, the kind of the richest in society kept their position and, and largely kept hold of their wealth. Um, so we see groups like uh, families like the Rockefellers at the very, very top in terms of wealth. And we all see there are other very wealthy families. Now, Roosevelt um, came from one of these wealthy families. Um, Truman married into the, one of them. Truman's wife um, came from one of these uh, very wealthy uh, families at the kind of the top of American society. Now, underneath that kind of very highest level, there was a degree of leveling out between uh, what we termed as, as, as white collar workers, kind of. Uh, professionals, um, the people who tended um, to work in um, in offices and in and uh, and and again work more with their minds and with their hands, uh, and then the blue collar workers who who were more your manual workers um, again just came down to different clothes that had been worn historically, uh, and and they 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 were this kind of the manual workers. Now, particularly with the growth of, of organized labor, actually, the, the gap between white collar and blue collar workers had, w was not hugely significant at this point in time. And both groups uh, were in green, uh, enjoying a degree of prosperity, as we saw earlier. Now, one of the reasons why this, this gap had narrowed was because of the actions of organized labor and the demand for manual labor uh, uh, during, the, during the war. And the trade unions they did a good job of pushing their members' uh, wages up. But going beyond 45, the, the trade unions are going to see their position come under attack as, as anything that's on slightly left of centre at all in the American political spectrum at this point in time gets labelled communists and comes under uh, attack. Another interesting uh, development in terms of, of American society is to do with uh, the position of women. Now, female workers played a massive role in the war effort. So 36% of the workforce in 44 was female. This included large numbers of women working in munitions and agriculture uh, and in, in a, a numerous sets of jobs and things that had traditionally been considered to be male jobs. Now, the idea that this would lead to a permanent shift in, in traditional gender roles, well, however, was fairly short lived with about 12 million men returning from military service, they needed to be found work. And again, in a lot of ways, um, society went back to how it had been prior to the war. 
in terms of trying to um, to help and reintegrate the, um, the returning men, uh, we get the GI Bill uh, in 44, which is designed to help returning soldiers, and it would give them things like access to university tuition loans, uh, university tuition loans to start businesses, uh, low cost mortgages. And again, this is seen as a huge positive and helping things like social mobility. But again, uh, we see this divide in terms of ethnicity. Uh, only one in five African-American servicemen who applied for the educational funding actually got a place in college. So we can see, again, there is opportunity, which fulfills the idea of the American dream. But there's, there's, there's also that degree of myth in it where we've got particular parts of society, largely based on ethnicity, who are being denied full access to things that they would feel entitled to and that they, they're seeing other people enjoying. Again, I hope that's been useful for you. If it has, then please um, hit the like button. If you have any comments, then please, or, or questions, please leave those uh, below. If you haven't done so already, then please do subscribe. Uh, this is one of a, a series of videos looking at America 1945 to 1980 in my play, playlist, looking at this, uh, the American dream, myth and reality, uh, which goes from 1945 to 1980. And, and, and there's also a whole series of playlists. Again, one that we closely linked to this is one on uh, circa 1845 through to uh, 1877, which looks, looks at the era of uh, the American Civil War. Uh, there's also uh, politics playlists, including a, a US politics playlist, which will help you understand some of the structures and political ideas behind the stuff that's going on in this as well. There's also uh, a series of playlists on other bits of history. So there's um, modern Britain, there is Tudor Britain, there are, is Tsarist Zar and communist Russia. So a whole range of things to enjoy on the channel. So please do subscribe, turn on notifications and explore the channel and check out the different playlists and different videos available. Thank you very much for watching.